Dus wanneer is een tuin af? Nooit. Je ontwerpt hem en uh, dan ga je kijken. En dan moet je dus weten wat je wilt. En dan moet je het karakter wat je gegeven hebt handhaven. The history of the Mean Rouse Gardens. Who was Mean Rouse? Mean Rouse was born on the 12th of April 1904 in Dedemsvaart, a small village in the northeastern part of the Netherlands. Her father, Bonner House, owned a nursery of a few hundred acres. Moorheim Nursery was one of the most prominent nurseries in Europe, not only because of the size, but also because through cross-pollination new kinds of plants were developed. Mean Rice grew up in the midst of fields of delphiniums and flocks and learned to love perennial plants. This gave her the idea of using them in the garden and experimenting with combinations of perennials in order to learn from this. In 1924, she started doing this in her parents' kitchen garden and orchard. Hence, the foundation was laid for her experimental gardens which were to develop into a complex of 30 different gardens covering an area of 6.18 acres. Many visitors came to visit her gardens, including royalty. The Wilderness Garden, 1924. Mead Rouse's first experiment was one with plants and shade. The plan was to choose plants suitable for growth in the shade and to let them grow wild in order to find out which plants would spread easily and which would not. This garden was also an experiment with design. In the midst of the unkempt plants, a little pond was built as a sort of centre point. The contrast between this straight form, which Mean Rouse later called my first attempt of architecture, and the loose abundant plant growth, makes this garden fascinating. Later, this combination was to become her trademark, reoccurring in all her designs. Straight forms contrasting with the loose natural way of plant growth. This contrast between culture and nature makes the garden interesting. The Old Experimental Garden Mean Rouse designed her second experimental garden in 1927. A typical example of the use of design and use of plants at that time. She wanted to experiment with different sorts of brightly coloured plants in the full glare of the sun. A sequence of shape, colour, height and flowering time was turned into a harmonious composition. This is a traditional English border as it was in those days. In all her gardens, Mean Rouse considered the use of the space just as important as the types of plants chosen. This is a garden full of contrasts. First of all, a contrast between light and shade. This seems to make the border extra exuberant and colourful. Opposite the border, on the other side of the lawn, the garden is bounded by a waving green row of shrubs contrasting with the colours of the border. Some plants have been planted on the other side of the path so that sometimes you're walking alongside the flowers and sometimes in between them. Development and Inspiration Mean Rouse not only developed a great knowledge of perennials, but was also very talented in creating exceptional combinations. She had a great sense of design and use of space, which is always the starting point in a garden. Her qualities as a garden designer soon enabled her to become head of the garden architecture department at her father's nursery. Her parents encouraged her to gain further knowledge, which resulted in working in nurseries in England. There she met Gertrude Jekyll, who created the perennial borders. 
Meenraus also studied for a year in Berlin, following the very first course for garden architecture. Visits to theatres and museums always influenced her greatly. During the years of crisis, in the 30s, she took lessons in architecture at Delft University. Just before the Second World War, she moved to Amsterdam in order to gain more contact with architects and town planners. She also established her department of garden architecture there. She met architects belonging to the Dutch school of new building style, who worked according to the principles of functionalism. Functionalism was a way of design, a line of architecture in which she could identify herself and she felt connected to it. She had already learnt about the Bauhaus movement in Berlin. Other well-known architects that Meenraus worked with were Gerrit Rietveld and Ben Merkelbach. Publications In Amsterdam, Meenraus became acquainted with Theo Musselt, a publisher, and later married him. He encouraged her to write and publish books about her work and her ideas on design. The first book Meenraus wrote about plants was published in 1939. The publications of Meenraus were written both for garden amateurs and for professionals. A good example is the book about perennials, published in Dutch in 1950. This book was also translated into German and Swedish. The Dutch version had six new editions, the last one in 1979. Her method of work. Meenraus lived only for her work. In an almost rigid manner, she worked very conscientiously on her designs. Anything that disturbed her work or concentration was pushed aside. For 70 years, she made plans and designs, probably a few thousand in all. And for 70 years, she experimented and worked out new ideas about design, materials and combinations of plants. The experimental gardens in Davensvaart are a reflection of her work and its development. It is a chronological overview of almost a century of Dutch garden architecture. It is as if one is stepping through time, following the development of garden architecture during the previous century. A unique example of Dutch cultural heritage which deservedly received the status of an official national monument. The Water Garden, 1954. The Water Garden is without grass and the design is based on the paving and the little spaces left for planting. It is always a question of balance between the area of stone and the plants. The pond with its marsh containers and the little raised walls with different heights create a variation in circumstances of growth from very wet to very dry. In a very small space, plants needing different circumstances could be tried out and compared. The Dutch Garden Magazine. In her books, Meenraus was able to record her experiences with plants and design and use of material. She also recognised the importance of giving information and advice to the public about these experiences. She and her husband developed the idea of producing a quarterly garden magazine publishing articles written by her and by friends and colleagues. Now it is the oldest garden magazine in the Netherlands. Through this magazine, Meenraus was able to pass on her ideas on gardening and design to a great many people. In doing this, she had a great influence on gardening in the Netherlands. Standard Perennial Borders 1960. In the building industry, after the Second World War, 
architects began to use prefabricated materials. Using this very same idea, Meenraz developed a whole series of standard borders using strong and healthy perennials with a long flowering period and easy to grow. She made borders in different lengths and colours, suitable for sandy, clay or peach soil and for sun or shade. These borders were not designed following certain garden plans, but standard confection, as she called it. She tried out a great many in her experimental gardens. When a particular garden was ordered, a useful instruction book was supplied with it, explaining how to plant and take care of the garden. Weekend, 1950. In her summer house, built in the gardens, Meenraz designed a private garden for herself. For small gardens in this period of time, she often used diagonal lines to make a small square area more intriguing and interesting. By using the diagonal lines, the grass and the border come right up close to the French window. Looking out from the living room, you see green grass and colourful plants. The Small Town Garden, 1960. After the war, people became more interested in gardening. This average garden is an experiment to create a small back garden in the right way using simple materials. Meenraz illustrated how to make a small garden look bigger by using simple principles, emphasising a diagonal line. In a right angle, this is the longest line. By laying the paving diagonally, you emphasise that and the garden looks bigger. A tree gives depth and brings perspective to the garden. Besides that, a contrast between sun and shade makes the garden more interesting. Small gardens are often narrow. There is always a tendency to place the path, grass, plants and hedges parallel to each other, making the garden look even smaller. In this garden, the emphasis has been placed on the width by letting the grass grow from one side right to the other. This creates an idea of space. The diagonal path has been laid in such a way that the grass runs right through it and has not been cut in half. The garden boundaries consist of different materials in different heights. The Sunken Garden, 1960. The Netherlands is a flat country. This garden is an experiment with differences in heights and use of recycled material. By just going down two steps, a certain feeling of privacy is created with a minimum of difference in height. Any dug-out soil was reused to create the flower beds. The railway sleepers were not only used to make the steps, but also to create a much more complex design of lines, making the steps a logical part of this. The Reed Pond, 1960. In the 60s, synthetic prefabricated ponds came on the market. As Meenraz used her experimental gardens to try out new materials, she also tried using a synthetic polyester pond. She chose a minimum of plants so that there would be enough reflection from the water. On three of the sides, grass going right down to the edge of the water, and on the fourth side, a small terrace also going right down to the water's edge. The high miscanthus reeds form a pleasant background to the small terrace. The Square Garden, 1974. Meenraz often used geometric forms in her designs. This garden is a composition of paving and flower beds. The whole garden is made up of squares. These squares are different in size and are at angles to each other, creating an interesting design, 
similar to Piet Mondrian in his paintings. To enhance this effect, the flower beds are filled with perennials in the prime colours of red, yellow and blue. In the 50s, Mienraas often worked with Gerrit Rietveld, a Dutch architect and designer. Rietveld's chairs in the garden emphasised this cooperation. The Mixed Border, 1974 In this border, Mienraas tried to combine perennials with shrubs and roses. The aim was to create a border which also had structure and colour in the winter and early spring. The shrubs she chose were long flowering roses and shrubs with a special leaf colouring. The border is arranged in shades of pink, white, blue, purple and crimson flowering plants with grey and brown leaf added to it. The Flower Terrace, 1982 Another experimental design without grass. Two large squares of paving, placed at different angles and with a difference in height of one step, form the main part of this garden. In contrast to these great squares, irregular flower beds have been formed in the paving and filled with perennials in soft pastel tints combined with shrub roses and decorative grasses. The design of the little garden beds in the paving leaves enough room to walk along and also forms two terraces. The Yellow Circle Garden, 1982 In this garden, Minrise created a circle following the circular line of the larch hedge this circular form is emphasised by using yellow paving stones around the edge. The space between these stones and the larch hedge is filled with border plants. This is not the same width everywhere because of the curving of the hedge. The grass in the circle is slightly sunken, no more than about 10 centimetres, and if you're not aware of this, you may not even notice it but you can feel the difference. The Wood, 1987 In this existing wood, Meenraas shows us that by using a clearing in the wood, the space can become very interesting. This was emphasised by making a slightly raised circular area in the middle of the clearing and a path around the edge of it. The outer edge was filled in by planting holly trees and rhododendrons to emphasise the closed-in effect. The open space is so large that the tops of the trees don't touch each other and light falls into the circle. The Marsh Garden, 1990 The motive for this experiment was making use of a new product which had come on the market recycled plastic. This is a very durable and environmental friendly product that even looks good. It resulted in an experiment with marsh plants which were running wild and a long plank bridge with square stepping stones. The straight form of the plank bridges and the unkempt plants made a fascinating contrast between architecture and nature, an important feature in nearly all Meenraas's designs. In each square, the planks lie in a different direction, emphasising each square individually. The Grasses Garden, 1993 In the 80s and 90s, growers had introduced many new sorts of ornamental grasses and Meenraas wanted to experiment with these as well. She planted them freely in a large gravel area. Because the square flower bed is in the open grass area, the transparent and delicate forms of the grasses is shown clearly. The Clipped Garden, 1999 In a certain way, this garden marks a historical moment in the history of the gardens in Dedensvaart. The design is made by Annette Scholmer, 
managing director of the Bureau Mean Raus in Amsterdam. The garden was designed to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the gardens. However, in the January of 1999, Mean Raus passed away. The designs we show you from this point onwards are the responsibility of the Bureau Mean Raus in Amsterdam and the Mean Raus Foundation. The basic idea for the design of the clip garden was creating a garden without flowers, combining different architectural elements. The central element is a large elongated pond. A straight square paving stone with a top layer of Belgian freestone was chosen for the paving. Around the edge of the area are clipped evergreen hedges contrasting greatly with the loose edges of grasses. The water sculptures of Henk Rusman add a special touch. The Corner Garden, 1999. The shape of this garden requires a different kind of planting. In the middle there is a large area of asters, the sort that stays short, forming a thick blanket of plants. In the summer this is a quiet green colour and in the autumn a spectacular blue. Around this patch of asters there are loose groups of vertical and transparent sorts like decorative grasses and the delicate Ferbina bonariensis. They form a kind of transparent curtain through which the rest of the garden is vaguely visible. During the season the blue colour gradually appears. The New Border Garden, 2000. This border has been planted according to a German principle of planting, the starting point being the natural development of plants. Sorts are put together, which are often found growing together, and also require the same type of soil and amount of light. This border has a clear plan. The main plants are planted at regular intervals from each other. After that, the accompanying plants are chosen and then finally those that are used to fill in any gaps. The different sorts of plants are not in separate groups but are intermingled. The Autumn Garden, 2002. For this garden, Plants have been chosen which are at their best in the autumn. Not only late flowering perennials and ornamental grasses, but also shrubs bearing berries and those giving a brightly coloured autumn look. In the autumn, the grapevine forms a red curtain of flames. The path winds through this garden and is laid slightly deeper. In this way, the feeling of walking between the plants is emphasised. The New Collection, 2007. Surrounded by an L-shaped hedge and an L-shaped pergola with semi-transparent wood shield is a garden with one large and seven smaller square beds. The largest has been planted with Descampsia. In the seven beds around this, well-known Dutch nursery gardeners show plants of their own choice. The Roof Garden, 2009. In this garden, experiments with movable elements of Plato wood and surprising combinations of plants have been the focal point. Plato wood is environmentally friendly processed wood. Different sorts of wood can be used in this way. New Experimental Garden. The design of this garden includes many of Mean Rouse's principles of design form. The use of squares, straight hedges, cut grass and rough grass and a clear structure of paths. As well as statues, new experiments with the use of plants are shown. Interesting combinations of roses, helleniums and other perennials. There is also the grow and flower border. A few final remarks. In 1924, 
Meanrise began her experiments with design and planting here in Dedemsfart. This is still being carried on by the present gardeners and the Mean Rouse Bureau. Because of this, the Mean Rouse Gardens is not only beautiful cultural heritage, including the three national monuments, but it has also become a source of inspiration for many people who visit the gardens. In 2008, a new book on the gardens was published, Experiments with Plants and a Search for Form. This book, written in Dutch by Annette Schormer, the present director of the Meenrouse Bureau in Amsterdam, includes translations in English and German. It portrays a vivid picture of Meenrouse and the development of the gardens here in Dedemsvaart. This book is on sale in the tea room. It is with great pleasure that we work on the preservation and further development of the Mean Rouse Gardens. Terwijl Rouse, wanneer is een tuin af?